um, good morning and uh, welcome to this um, side event that is uh, uh, organized by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and uh, co-sponsored by the, um, uh, the Republic of the Philippines, the transmission of the Philippines to the United Nations and the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, OSCE. Uh, it is really uh, our pleasure to uh, uh, welcome you all here uh, uh, for this uh, very important event. And um, we are um, uh, very pleased uh, that uh, we were managed to, uh, to organize this event that really um, was originated um, uh, through a conversation we had uh, with um, Ms. Uh, Kendall Lamo, who um, I'm sure you will uh, hear from. Um, education for survivors and victims of trafficking and we thought this was really a, um, a, a very important uh, opportunity for us uh, being all uh, gathered uh, for the appraisal of the global plan of action this high level event that's going on uh, in New York that started yesterday and uh, will continue today uh, to have a dedicated uh, event for uh, education for survivors and, and victims of trafficking. This is really an important part of uh, UNODC work to promote uh, the greater understanding of the crime of uh, human trafficking in persons through education. Uh, we um, have uh, a very dedicated program on education for justice initiative that was generously funded by the state of Qatar, which was awarded uh, in 2020 the Secretary General Award for Innovation, an inclusive set of products, uh, activities and modules uh, uh, to assist educators uh, in teaching the next generation to understand crimes like uh, trafficking. But UNODC also manages the uh, UN Trust Fund for Victims uh, of Trafficking, uh, which provides direct support to victims globally. And we're very uh, pleased that we'll be hearing from Dame Julie uh, later this morning, the chair of the, the Trust Fund. Um, we would like maybe some uh, housekeeping, uh, uh, housekeeping matters because the agenda today is uh, really, really packed. Uh, we'll unfortunately not be able to have a, a Q&A uh, session. Nonetheless, if you have specific questions addressed to the um, uh, to the panelists, please feel free to use the, the chat function and we will, of course, relay them uh, to the respective uh, panelists. But if you could put uh, your microphones muted and your videos off, uh, unless you're one of the speakers, this will really facilitate some smooth technical running uh, of the event. So let's uh, start now with um, uh, the first um, um, intervention for this event. And, and as I mentioned in, in my introductory remarks, we are very pleased uh, to um, co-sponsor this event with the permission of uh, the Philippines to, um, uh, to the UN in New York. Um, Ambassador Manolo has been uh, one of the co-facilitators for um, the uh, political declaration that was adopted yesterday uh, after the opening segment of the high-level event on uh, trafficking persons. And the um, personal dedication uh, demonstrated throughout the whole uh, process uh, um, led us to really believe that, you know, the Philippines w uh, is really a, a, a at the core of this, this, this work and this perspective on uh, uh, putting the victims really at the center of the heart of uh, their uh, countering the um, trafficking persons uh, uh, policy and, and work. So we're very pleased to uh, listen to a statement by uh, Ambassador Manolo. Thank you. Excellencies. Distinguished guests, good morning. I thank the UNODC and the University Alliance on Human Trafficking for organizing this important event, which the Philippines is pleased to co-sponsor. Combating human trafficking is a priority of the Philippine government. Led by the Interagency Council Against Trafficking in Persons, or IACAT, the government employs a whole-of-society approach to eliminate this heinous crime. All agencies of government, including the foreign affairs, whose mandates are relevant to combating trafficking are represented in the IACAT. Civil society 
is very much involved in the effort, both formally and informally. The sectors of women, migrants, and children are represented in the formal structure of the Ayakat, in formal groups, including dance clubs, parents' associations, and faith-based groups also conduct awareness-raising campaigns against trafficking. Since most human trafficking occurs in cross-border situations, it is important to establish regional and international cooperative mechanisms to effectively address it. Consistent with my government's commitment to actively fight human trafficking, I gladly took on the role as co-facilitator of the modalities resolution for the high-level meeting to appraise the global plan of action to combat trafficking in persons. I also co-facilitated the intergovernmental negotiations for the political declaration that was adopted at the high-level meeting. Protection and support for victims and survivors of human trafficking is one of the pillars of the Global Plan of Action to Combat Trafficking in Persons. In the political declaration, we call for full respect for the human rights of victims and survivors, providing them with victim-centered and trauma-informed care, assistance and services, including long-term support and reintegration. The political declaration recognizes the role of victims and survivors as agents of change in the global fight against human trafficking, acknowledging the need to incorporate their perspective and experience in all efforts to prevent and combat human trafficking. Governments aim to actively involve victims and survivors in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of anti-trafficking policies and programs. Education is an important component of reintegrating victims and survivors of human trafficking. Education expands their opportunities for employment, decent work, or entrepreneurship, and significantly reduces their risk of being re-victimized. In the Philippines, victims and survivors of human trafficking can access free education in all public high schools, colleges, and universities. Our Congress mandated free college education for all students in all state-owned colleges and universities in an effort to increase opportunities for all citizens and to remove barriers to human development caused by poverty. For victims and survivors who choose to pursue technical and vocational education and training, the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, or TESDA, has numerous Tibet programs offered for free. TESDA also offers these programs in shelters for trafficked women supervised by Philippine embassies and consulates abroad. While trafficking victims await the resolution of the cases filed against their traffickers, they are provided technical training, upskilling, and vocational courses. Giving trafficking victims and survivors a seat at the table is important in the fight against human trafficking. Victims and survivors have lived experiences that can inform policy making and enhance the effectiveness of existing programs. Mainstreaming anti-trafficking issues in education by learning from the experience, not just of anti-trafficking authorities, but also of trafficking victims, can lead to greater awareness of the issue and improvement of prevention efforts. I am pleased about the participation of universities and educational institutions in today's event. Ending human trafficking is a challenge that all of society, including the academic, should take on. I look forward to today's important discussion. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, uh, uh, Ambassador Manolo, for those uh, uh, very uh, important remarks. And to also re-emphasize the, um, the framework in which uh, we are operating. Um, as you know, UNODC is the guardian of the uh, um, UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, also called the Palermo Convention. In particular, uh, it's Article 6, which really states that parties are to consider implementing measures to provide for the physical, psychological, and, and social recovery of victims of trafficking, including through the, the, the provisions of um, uh, employment, educational, and training opportunities 
communities. And this is really what this uh, side event is, is all about. And we're very pleased to uh, uh, welcome uh, a very uh, strong partner of uh, UNODC in this fight against uh, uh, human trafficking and, and a constant uh, advocate for um, uh, the importance of victims' rights. And this is the European Union. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Ambassador uh, Gonzato, who is the uh, Deputy Permanent Representative of the UN, uh, European Union to the UN here in New York. And Ambassador, I would like to give you the floor now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Delphine, and uh, thank you to UNODC and to Ambassador Manolo and the Mission of the Philippines to the UN for organizing this important event, which really gives us an opportunity to, to learn from victims and survivors themselves about the gaps that they experience in their protection, in their assistance and their reintegration, which is the most uh, important part. And, and about providing uh, multifaceted support to them, uh, particularly in the educational sector, which is the focus of today's discussion. But let me also say a word of thank and, and appreciation to Kendall Alaimo. I mean, what, what a great idea you had with the SIDS for Survivors. You know, it's such a creative and innovative way uh, to raise awareness about the, the needs and, and the situation of victims and, and uh, survivors of, of trafficking. And I really look forward to hearing more about opportunities for other universities and other stakeholders to engage in this in these initiatives. We really must try and do our best to um, magnify it and give it, give it, uh, you know, uh, and support it. Um, as you said, Delphine, you can really count on the European Union to continue to advocate for the rights of the victims uh, uh, of trafficking in, in persons. But advocacy is not enough, and that's why we use legal means and provide also concrete financial support. And our approach is victim-centered, is, is also gender-specific and child-sensitive, which is extremely important for the success of, of the approach. <clears throat> this is what the EU strategy on combating trafficking in human beings uh, is about. It uh, covers the period 2021 to 2025. And tries, this strategy tries to address trafficking in a comprehensive way by reducing the demand that fosters the crime, by breaking the criminal business model of traffickers, both offline and online, by protecting, supporting and empowering the victim, especially women and children, Excellency, I think we lost you. We lost the connection. Yes, I'm sorry. The um, the connection is unstable for some reason. It's the third time that I'm kicked out. So, as I was saying, the strategy is about uh, it tries to address in a comprehensive way the phenomenon of trafficking by reducing the demand that fosters the crime, by breaking the criminal business model of traffickers, both offline and online by protecting, supporting, and empowering the victims, especially women and children, and by promoting international cooperation. And we see the early identification of potential victims of trafficking as crucial to promptly assist, support, and protect them, and to enable the police and prosecution authorities to better investigate and punish traffickers. However, there are still many challenges, uh, and we see as key actions um, the, the, the need to enhance capacity building and sharing of best practices. So today's event is about this for the identification of victims of trafficking, in particular among vulnerable groups, including through dedicated funding for training of police, social workers, inspector services, border guards, among other practitioners likely to come into contact with victims. We also need to facilitate their reintegration and victim empowerment programs. We need to enable targeted support to specialized shelters for victims of trafficking, including specialized facilities for trafficked women and children via the Asylum, Migration and Integration Fund and the Internal Security Fund that we have in the EU. And also we need to ensure funding in non-EU partner countries, non-governmental organization, migrant resource centers for supporting victims, taking into account gender and child-specific needs, as I was saying before. The EU member states have put in place services for the long-term assistance, reintegration, or for the prevention of re-trafficking of victims, which often focus on finding and securing employment, increasing victims' level of education, providing long-term psychological and social counseling for victims, 
or assisting the victims in finding accommodation, which is also crucial. We facilitate programs supporting victims in their recovery and reintegration, such as health, psychological or legal specialized services, and facilitating access to education and economic opportunities. An example of how we cooperate with, uh, with non-EU countries is the TACT project that works to create conditions for the safe and sustainable voluntary return and reintegration of victims of trafficking from France, Greece, Italy, Poland and Spain to three priority countries of origin, Albania, Morocco and Ukraine. But we also have the EU-funded Global Action Against Trafficking in Persons and Smuggling of Migrants in Asia and the Middle East. Um, which has, has been implemented with the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Republic of Iraq and the Republic of Pakistan, which includes the provision of direct assistance to victims of human trafficking and vulnerable migrants through the strengthening of identification, referral and protection mechanism. However, the opportunities for victims to rebuild their lives remain limited as reintegration and rehabilitation programs need to be further developed. This is really the weak part and we really need to focus uh, our efforts on that. We need to provide opportunities for durable solutions such as inclusion into the labor market because these are still scarce. On top, we've seen that the coronavirus pandemic has illustrated the agility of organized crime groups in adapting their operations to changes in their environment. So we need to adapt ourselves and be, and be agile in, in tackling this. Social, economic and educational measures are essential for victims to reintegrate into society. And victims, according to the Palermo Convention, are right holders and we should treat them like that. Looking, I therefore looking forward to hear the presentations today to the different panelists and see how, based on their experience, we can improve the way in which we support and guarantee those rights. Thank you very much, Delphine. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Excellency, and, and thanks for really um, emphasizing the fact that, you know, um, socioeconomic uh, uh, measures need to be put in place to help uh, uh, victim survivors to um, uh, to get onto their lives and to really um, um, be able to build on uh, on, the, on the new life and the new um, perspective. Uh, and this is really what uh, we've been hearing from a lot of um, uh, former victim survivors and, and launching initiative to really help others in going through and avoiding some of the pitfalls that they had to uh, endure uh, while they were um, trying to um, um, recover from um, being a, a victim and survivor. And that, uh, of course, leads us to um, the um, Let's say the, the the guest speaker for this uh, for this event, and and of course no offense to all the other great panelists and uh, academic and representative of regional organization that will be following. But as I, as I mentioned, really the inspiration behind this side event is really uh, around the the personality and and wonderful work of um, um, of Kendall uh, Alimo, and so um, this this event is also co-sponsored by the University uh, Alliance on Human Trafficking that. Uh, uh, that that Kendall has uh, inaugurated and, and founded uh, to really help and uh, boost the uh, education for uh, survivors. And you will see, you've seen probably uh, in her art, all of the red chair that she's actually putting in all uh, various universities to emphasize the fact that um, victim survivors do have uh, the right uh, to access for education. And this is really their way, uh, their their need uh, for uh, a good recovery, both uh, economically, socially, but also mentally. So um, we, this is a, a you know a very uh, inspirational uh, uh, thoughts for, for for all of us, and would like to, uh, of course, ask maybe Kendall if she could uh, tell us a bit what motivated her in um, in launching and creating this uh, university alliance on on human trafficking. Kendall, you have the floor. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, um, excellencies, ambassadors, um, ladies and gentlemen. I am um, so moved this morning to see us all come together and thank you so much um, for supporting my vision and my dreams to help other survivors 
um, finally obtained there. So thank you so very much for having me. Um, before I dive into really why I founded the University Alliance, I did want to mention um, one thing. I am on screen alone today, but I am not alone in the world. Um, earlier this year, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe launched the groundbreaking International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council, um, which I'm very proud to sit on with um, 21 other amazing survivors that I work with from 14 countries to advise um, 57 um, participating states on um, policy for change. And really, ICETAC is, is really revolutionizing um, survivor engagement in the sense that they're not using our voices tokenistically, but they really engage us um, as peer professionals like you all here today. So it's a joy to um, sit on that council and serve that council and support my fellow members. Um, before I start talking about the University Alliance, Alliance and um, why I sent the chairs out. I have a few fellow council members to thank for aiding me in getting these chairs to a few countries I couldn't reach without them. So I'd like to thank um, Chandra from Germany for bringing a red seat to a university from my council. I'd like to thank Hiab in Scotland for walking a chair to a university. And I'd like to thank Regina for not only bringing a chair, she couldn't find a red one and she went out and got a white one and painted it and brought it all the way to Oslo in Norway. So thank you so very much. And to all my other council members um, that had supported me um, getting these chairs around the world and friends that had walked them to institutions I couldn't reach from America. Thank you so very much. Um, I wanna start with this quote and um, it means so much to me and you'll find out why. Um, there's a quote by Nelson Mandela and he says, education is the most powerful weapon in which you can use to change the world. And I believe that that's true. And I'm going to tell you why. We know in this community that when survivors exit trafficking situations, they're not just falling into small gaps, but large canyons without the resources they need to desperately dig themselves out and find their way home. And they really need education to get home, right? Because I wanna talk also about, I know we're gonna be talking about um, trauma-informed care, which is so important. Um, and also ethical care is extremely important to me um, in this outside of education later. Uh, but really when we're talking about the pathology of a survivor, it's very complex. And we're talking about trauma and PTSD. Um, one of the symptoms of PTSD is avoidance, right? And so um, you avoid um, things that remind you of your trauma. And when we're talking about child sex trafficking or labor trafficking, what that has in common is a trauma around work. And so why education is so imperative for this population outside of obtaining economic equity to finally afford themselves a way home in a sense is that work can become a trauma. And so I think it's imperative that survivors can not only go to school, but they can choose their curriculum, which is also going to determine um, their career paths, right? These, these survivors need careers and not just jobs but determine their careers that they feel safe in performing every day so they can sustain employment um, and have um, sustained freedom in a sense. And really when we're talking about survivors exiting, um, a lot of times we're talking about them also going into safe housing or safe houses, right? And I often think about the word house and home and there's a difference, right? I think um, we really need to get these survivors education to get careers and economic equity so that they can finally go from those safe houses to forever homes um, and sustained freedom, as mentioned. Um, part of my story is I've had a really long road and to get here today, and uh, it's a miracle I'm alive in, in a lot of ways. So thank you so much for having me here today, I'm breathing and talking and, and speaking about things that I think are in many senses life-saving. But my, my journey um, with medical care was long Long and hard. Um, I am a survivor of child trafficking and re-exploitation. And really my journey was so long. And really what I saw is that we have a lack of clinical care um, in doctors that really understand how to treat this narrative effectively. And so really my dream was that, you know, I kept thinking, geez, if, if Nelson Mandela could go from prisoner to president, then I could certainly go from patient to practitioner. And my dream was to become um, a desperately needed doctor in this community. And I kept getting into school and having barriers um, due to the fallout of my trafficking situation um, and a lot of various reasons I couldn't attend. Um, it's, it's, I, I brought these sneakers here with me today. A couple of people at United Nations know I brought them. 
Um, but they're really important to me because I got into graduate school um, years ago and I couldn't attend, but I used these sneakers, these very sneakers to run around a campus to raise awareness um, about the inaccess that survivors can face due to the fallout of their trafficking situation. <laughs> And um, I, Rachira is on this call, but I want to let her know uh, after I ran her on that campus, I took a bus to NYU to sit with the professor to talk about this access in these very sneakers. And um, it's just such a joy to have them back here in New York. If I get the pleasure of meeting you, Rachira, this weekend, I will wear these at our meeting. So these are very important. And it's really about, you know, um, actually footprints to freedom, my, my fellow council uh, member Malaika. So in a sense, these are my footprints. So I wanted to share these sneakers with you all today. Um, so yeah, I ended up getting into graduate school many times. And in part of my story, what we're seeing is a lot of survivors is unfortunately, I got re-exploited re um, in between getting into graduate school and it really affected me and it's gonna take a lifetime of healing to recover from. And I really didn't want this um, to happen to another survivor. And the second time I applied for graduate school as an artist, I'm really visual. And I kept thinking, you know, what do, what do I need? What do I need? And I needed a symbol of hope. And what I did is I actually ordered a chair. I'm gonna share this chair. <laughs> I ordered a folding chair. And I told myself as an artist, it's gonna be a visual representation of hope for me. And I sat in that chair hoping I'd find my way to school and I couldn't. And I grew depressed and I couldn't um, obtain my dreams to become who I wanted to become, which was that needed clinician. And as a little girl, when I was trafficked, I wasn't even allowed to use really my own name and I couldn't be who I, who I was as a child and I couldn't be who I wanted to become as, as a doctor to serve this community. Um, and we need to create pathways for these survivors to really become who, who they want to become and serve as professionals on a, on a really um, high level. But I did purchase this seat. I didn't make it to school, but what remained in my home um, was, was this very seat, you know, these seats. And I thought, how do we get universities to engage in dialogue about um, the inaccess from uh, multiple reasons survivors face to obtaining this education? And I had sent one seat out to a university here in America. And uh, what really, this seat was a gift to this institution. Um, and this seat was a symbol of the seats that I believe we can work together to create in classrooms around the world. Um, and it was a gift to start creating dialogue um, on these very pressing issues. And World Day was coming July 30th, 2021. And I thought, well, I sent one seat. Can I send out um, 10 or 20, 30? And um, there's some people on this call who very, very kindly, um, Dottie Skipper, I know you're here. Thank you so very much for helping me um, deploy more seats. But I thought, can I get a bunch of seats um, and send them around? So I actually ended up shipping. Um, seats around the United States, the, I'm sorry, the United um, States of America and around the world to academic institutions as a gift. And really these seats to me um, are also art. I think sending them as an artist was a performative piece. Um, I'd love to see them continue <laughs> to go around the world. Of course, this one came to the United Nations here with me uh, in, New, in, in New York with me. Um, but really, I sent these seats to engage universities to, to start creating the dialogue on why this access is so imperative. Um, so really, in a sense, I was taking a stand um, so that my fellow survivors could take a seat. And I really believe that um, we must educate to liberate, in a sense. And um, one thing I want to mention, too, is, you know, these survivors are some of the most resilient individuals I have really ever met. And what inspires me most about many of them is really, they don't just want to go to school um, to just have a career. They want to go to school to help fill the gaps and remedy these very human rights violations. These individuals want to become doctors to serve medically, attorneys to help in prosecution, and politicians um, to pull these red seats up to major tables and as um, you know, lived experience experts and um, with degrees so that their the volume of their voice um, is increased and they can really serve um, to eradicate human trafficking with these very degrees that they want to make an impact in the world. Um, and really, I feel if given a chance, uh, they're really truly uh, capable of changing our world. 
And uh, I sent these seats out um, with these intentions. And really, I thought, you know, how do we really solve this problem? Because I saw um, really there were similarities in my journey piecing together medical care and trying to piece together um, funds for housing through school or scholarships. And really, there it was not enough really resources and I saw the parallels between in access to medical care and in access to really being able to obtain an education and I really thought we really need an umbrella organization um, to get all of these universities um, to come together right in a sense I feel like if the world can come together um, in, in webinars like this then we can also encourage um, universities and academic institutions around the world to also come together and I hope um, and pray they come together under the University Alliance of Human Trafficking, um, which I founded on July 30th, uh, 2021, um, to really work together, you know, a little over a year ago, I had come up with a policy-based solution that I believe could fund these seats without piecing together um, the few external scholarships or getting um, to money out of the endowments from the institutions. I believe this is a solution. I would like to implement it um, and really have a policy-based solution under um, the University Alliance on Human Trafficking. And I will tell you yesterday, um, it was a great joy to speak at the United Nations General Assembly, but I know the best day of my life um, is going to be when the very first university um, signs off on this policy and we start liberating these incredible um, survivors. So, and, you know, I just want to mention, you know, a lot of times survivors too uh, get re-exploited over and over and it's it's something we're seeing and we need to talk about and also prevent. And as a survivor, you know, I've lost so much personally and um, I do have a fear of this idea being implemented without me. And what I'm asking is for the community to help me implement this idea. Um, and I'll also, I'm going to need, in order to really drive out this solution, I'm going to need organizational support. Um, I'm going to need funding and I'm going to need partnership um, to really drive this solution out globally um, to liberate many around the world in need. And we're talking about um, survivors in safe housing, right? We can't have them exit those houses without an education because really this education is like a life jacket on them to prevent that re-exploitation that I went through um, and that I want to eliminate happening um, to other survivors. So um, thank you so very much for having me, my sneakers and my red chair with me to here today. Thank you to all my friends at the United Nations and around the world. Um, and I really look forward to um, driving out this solution. I have one last thank you to the International Forum for Understanding as well for also um, supporting me in this work. So thank you so very much, um, everybody here today. Thank you so much, uh, Kendall. And there's not much to add to this uh, very inspirational um, um, words. And But at least you leave us with like a symbol. And I think the red chair, you know, it certainly uh, uh, attracts the attention of people. And this is, I think, what's what's needed. So uh, that's why we're so, so pleased and honored to be able to use your art as the branding for the high level event on the appraisal of the global faction. We also hear from the Inter uh, International Survivor of, of Trafficking Advisory Council uh, by our colleague uh, Tatiana from the OSCE uh, later uh, uh, in this event. But let me go uh, immediately to our second uh, panelist, Ms. Uh, uh, Rachel Lloyd. Ms. Lloyd is the CEO and founder of uh, Girls Educational Mentoring Services, or also called as GEMS. Uh, she's uh, nationally recognized for uh, innovative work in transforming the movement's understanding of survivors' leadership. And she was actually honored as one of the 50 women who changed the world by uh, Miss Magazine and recognized as the uh, uh, Rebook Human Rights Award. So GEMS is now one of the uh, largest um, uh, service providers uh, in this field and is providing support to over 450 girls and young women, uh, preventing outreach and education to about uh, over 1,000 uh, youth and training to over 1,300 professionals each year uh, in the United States. So we would like actually to, to, to hear from, um, uh, from Ms. Lloyd what she observed um, through a work as the founder and CEO of, of GEMS about the importance of uh, access to education for um, survivors of trafficking and what is some of the recommendation that uh, she, can, uh, she can give on based on, on, on the work of GEMS in changing the perception of the people and public opinion on, um, uh, on survivors and, and what, what is required for, to help them and to support them more generally. Ms. Lloyd, you have the floor. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I think this is a really, really important conversation to be having. Um, I know I don't have uh, a long time, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, so I, I, the the focus on education for GEMS really, I mean, partly came about, like Kendall, through my own experiences. I dropped out of uh, school when I was 13, um, and obviously that made me, that was one of the things that made me vulnerable um, to commercial sexual exploitation. And so when I got the opportunity to get my GED at 22 uh, and get a scholarship at 23, it was life changing. Um, and so having that support in my own life and having that ability to kind of access high le higher level education, um, even just getting my GED and feeling like I'd been able to finish high school, which was something I was incredibly ashamed of, uh, was was really critical for me. And so when I started GEMS in 1998, I found that, you know, a lot of the girls and young women that we were serving uh, had also dropped out very, very young um, and, you know, were not interested in going back to school at all because school had not been a safe place. School had not been a welcoming place. Uh, school had not been a place that felt supportive or engaging. Um, and then it became also a choice between education and employment. And so, right, why would I go to school if I can get a job at Burger King, which will at least feed me, my kid, etc. cetera. Um, and so uh, back in 2009, uh, we started uh, the 2008, we started the Educational Initiative um, program, and that provides stipends and incentives, financial stipends and incentives initially, um, just even to register for school. So there's, there's, you get a stipend just for signing up for school. Uh, and I can remember people saying, oh, but won't people just sign up and then just never go? Uh, but once you've gotten over that hurdle, now the likelihood that you actually show up and go to school has now infinitely increased. Um, and so we didn't find that people were just signing up for the money and then not going to school. We found that people were actually going to school. Um, the stipends and incentives uh, for completing a semester, for getting your GD, for getting your high school diploma, for your associate's degree, for your bachelor's degree. Um, and so, you know, we've we've been incredibly successful with that program. I mean, another component of that is obviously the wraparound and comprehensive services that we're providing at GEMS as a whole. So case management, housing, uh, therapeutic services, counseling, uh, group stuff, um, tutoring has been a, a critical piece there. Uh, and so we were really proud of the work that we were doing and had created a, a, an environment that celebrated education. And so, you know, for many of us, myself included, growing up, we didn't know many people who had gone to college or graduated from college. Uh, and so normalizing that in the GEMS community and so that right as soon as girls got their GED and they posted it on the, the wall of achievement, um, they would be asking each other like, oh, when are you signing up for college? And they'd be sharing about like their professors and their papers. And, and it began to normalize education in a way that just wasn't uh, present before. Um, and then we realized too that, and we've done a lot of work around kind of outcomes and evaluation and data. And we realized that we were getting a lot of girls to sign up for college, but a lot of girls were struggling to stay in. And I mean, that kind of tracks with what we know about uh, runaway and homeless youth, foster care youth, uh, low income youth, particularly low income youth of color, the first year or two in college is really critical and uh, a huge percentage of kids drop out. And so uh, we developed our college prep program, brought on somebody whose whole focus is just those kind of first two years, um, created uh, additional groups. We have a 12 week GEMS U, uh, which is a college prep kind of university uh, that is kind of the semester before you're going to go into college so that you have like a safe environment to kind of practice what being in college will be like and to learn about 
you know, financial aid and to learn about, you know, uh, how to write a paper and uh, all of these things that can feel so intimidating and overwhelming uh, and, and, and make you feel like, you know, there's something wrong with you um, and make you feel that it's because you're a survivor that you're struggling, not because colleges aren't necessarily set up uh, to help folks um, who have not had traditional educational pathways. Um, I think one of the, the critical pieces that has to be talked about is, is not just kind of the, the issue of survivors, but survivors, particularly uh, survivors of color and the impact um, you know, of, of educational inequity on survivors of color. I mean, we serve, GEM serves 99% girls and young women of color. Um, and, you know, there's tons of research at this point around, uh, you know, the, the educational system um, and how it treats girls and young women of color. Uh, and so making sure that like any programming and policies are intersectional and take that into consideration and that have that uh, lens around class and race and, and gender and right, all of the things that kind of uh, become barriers and obstacles. And I mean, you know, our, our, our work around our EI program has really been about kind of uh, trying to tackle as many of those obstacles as possible. So even the practical stuff of like getting to school, so Metro cards to get to school and backpacks and supplies and books, especially if once you get in college is super expensive. And so all of those kind of things, but also having that one-on-one -on -one support, having that peer support uh, and weekly kind of groups to, you know, be able to vent with your peers uh, around your, your school experiences. Um, and then making sure that we're celebrating uh, people's educational achievements and normalizing those uh, achievements for, for survivors in, in, in school. Um, I am incredibly proud of the work that we've done. Uh, and I always say my favorite checks to write are the ones where it's somebody getting their bachelor's degree. Um, and so we've had... Uh, Ra Rachel, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you there because we have so many other panelists um, um, following you. I'm, I'm really sorry. Can I, I think, finish my sentence? Of course, of course. We've had over 25 young women graduate with their bachelors, and we've currently got three young women, uh, two in med school, one in uh, postdoc. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so, so sorry for um, interrupting in the middle of this, the sentence. Um, I think what's, what's very um, uh, important throughout um, what you've been presenting is trying to do like a, some tailor-made courses. So taking into account what the, the person has gone through and, and supporting the person throughout the entire process, through entire various steps of education and um, stepping in when when it's needed. And uh, so thank you very much for sharing uh, this experience uh, with us. Uh, I would like now to um, uh, introduce um, uh, Dame Julia uh, Okadonli, who's um, uh, the chair of the UN Voluntary Trust Fund for Victims of Trafficking, particularly uh, women and children. Um, Dame um, um, Julie is the former director general of the National Agency for Prohibition of Trafficking Persons in uh, Nigeria. She's been a, a long dedicated uh, uh, activist in fighting human trafficking, and she's brought her invaluable expertise into uh, leading uh, the work of, uh, of the Trust Fund. And um, Dame Julie, we, we've heard about the importance of facilitating this uh, multifaceted support as part of the recovery and, and reintegration of victims of trafficking. So could you maybe tell us a bit more on the, the work of the Trust Fund in supporting particularly some of the uh, NGOs that are providing uh, assistance to um, victims and survivors? Thank you. Dame Julie, you have the floor. Thank you. You're muted. We unfortunately cannot hear you.
I'm Julie. Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Not very loud, at least myself. I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me now? Um, I think the sound is not very good at least, but um, just checking with uh, Hannah whether she can hear you well as well. We can hear you, Dame Julie. It's just very quiet. If you could possibly turn up your volume, uh, then that would be really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Okay, is it better now? A little better. The highest volume I have here. Can you hear me now? It's still very low, I'm afraid. Okay, let's try this then. Go ahead. Can I go ahead? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, delighted to be here today as of the new interlocutor activities, especially women and children. And Can you hear me? It's still very low. Oh, can I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead. And if you if your colleague can put the volume on. Yeah, the volume is on the highest now. I, I really don't know what's going on. Maybe it's your net or the network fault. Go ahead. All right, thank you very much. I, I want to thank you, NODC. The New York Liaison Office and the University Alliance of Human Trafficking for organizing this event. Um, despite the headway we have made so far, face the horrendous facts that human trafficking are undetected, unreported, identified, or unrecognized in a limbo without documentation for basic social security. Many of them are living on the margins of society, shaped by perennial stigma and illegalization. A victim-centered approach is based on embedded mandate of the Trust Fund established by the UN General Assembly in the Global Plan of Action to Combat Trafficking in Persons 2010. As an essential component of the Global Plan of Action since its inception, the Trust Fund has been creating meaningful and education opportunities along with psychological and emergency medical support, survival, which fund 25 NGOs funded in over 55 countries. As the only UN trust fund with a specific focus on women and girl victims and trafficking, the trust fund has been tailoring our position to specific needs and ensure equal opportunities for all gender and age groups, their physical, psychological, social recovery as well as reintegration into societies. Over the past 11 years, grants provided by the Trust Fund have had a significant impact on the lives of many survivors. It's very rewarding to know that many survivors who have jumped into traffic have been able to be assisted through this many different aspects. In Kenya, NGO awareness human trafficking has accessed the needs of approximately 200 survivors and their families and provided holistic training on basic skills and empowerment, ranging from farming, catering, hair salons, and other small entire households. Apart from formal education and vocational training, financial education also plays a significant role in strengthening long-term independence of survivors suffering from exploitation of traffickers. Many survivors are deprived of their financial identities or access to banking products, living dependent on traffickers haunted by fear of poverty, aiming to help survivors to gain financial independence. In Colombia, NGO Cooperación Espacio de Muye has been offering courses to survivors on the management of personal finances, employability, and entrepreneurship. 
Yesterday, you, have, you may have heard Ms. Betty Pregaza Lozano, director of that NGO, speak as a panelist during the high-level meeting itself. In Bangladesh, the NGO Association for Community Development has been organizing financial literacy and business planning courses, such as financial planning, budgeting, savings, capital recording, and so on. It's heart-wrenching to notice that survivors have been deprived of education opportunities and access to jobs due to the pandemic, which has directly impacted on their own lives and their families who depend on them. This issue has also, understandably, in many cases, caused their families psychological challenges as well. This pandemic compounded existing gender stereotypes and recurring discrimination among survivors, in particular women and children. However, it is inspiring that there is always light against darkness. I would also like to highlight the work of the NGO Rescue Foundation, an Indian organization. During lockdown time, girl survivors stepped up to prepare themselves to help other younger survivors when teachers were unable to be present in person. The NGO equipped them with skills so they could relay them to teach others. The NGO Athena in Serbia has also established an online psychological counseling center to organize virtual counseling and med mediation service on trauma integration and crisis intervention. Psychologists have used the integrative approach in their work with survivors residing within the NGO organization and further extended this to persons staying in other accommodations run by state institutions. Advancing the mandate of the Trust Fund as entrusted by the UN General Assembly to empower survivors has been and remains the cornerstone of this work. We endeavor to create more training educational and employment opportunities to disadvantage, discriminated and ostracized human trafficking survivors to reduce their vulnerability and bolster independence of individuals, as well as raise awareness of the public safer and more equal society. The funding level of $2 million per year, the trust fund can make a significant impact on the ground together with our selected NGO partners. In conclusion, I encourage you to support the Trust Fund and count on your solidarity to allow us to continue the important work in victims and survivors of Thank you very much, um, um, Dame Julie. And um, there was a possibility also uh, we we, we, we hope that uh, an event like the high-level uh, um, meeting on the praise of a global plan of action has really uh, shed the light on the wonderful work that the Trust Fund is doing and, and uh, will generate uh, some support, additional support from other uh, member states uh, in the wonderful work that uh, the Trust Fund is, uh, is doing. And we're very, very proud to, um, um, to be uh, assisting you in this, uh, in this endeavor. So thank you very much for your participation today. Let me turn now to uh, our next uh, uh, panelist, uh, Professor Bushira Gupta from the uh, New York University and uh, founder president of the uh, Apni Hap Women Worldwide. Um, uh, Professor Gupta is a professor, so at the NYU, but also distinguished scholar of the University of uh, Berkeley, uh, uh, University of California in Berkeley. And for over three years, she's been campaigning and working um, uh, for a world where no girl and women are brought or sold. So she's helped in uh, uh, introducing a lot of um, anti-trafficking, shaping anti-trafficking policy and been assisting uh, uh, many uh, uh, NGOs uh, across the world. So Professor Gupta, I would like to know, um, based on, on your uh, invaluable uh, long-standing experience, what kind of um, um, uh, advice you would actually give to uh, uh, member states uh, in uh, trying to design uh, some of the modules or, or teaching or policies with regard to uh, anti-trafficking in person? Um, and, and, and how do you think these uh, policies uh, would be better tailored to really uh, uh, assist the ones that are really in need? Thank you. Thank you, Delphine, and a big shout out to Rachel Lloyd and Kendall Alamo 
for explaining uh, how they have used education as a way of changing everything for uh, survivors of sex trafficking. Um, Rachel has used it in her NGO to actually help in the process of reintegration and prevention, and Kendall is doing it to educate the world and find a seat for survivors. Uh, a big thank you to UNODC and to OSCE for taking this initiative along with ISATC and the University Alliance um, to make sure that this is in the Global Plan for Action. I am a professor at New York University, and I have been an activist against sex trafficking for nearly two decades now. I began as a journalist uh, when I made a documentary on the trafficking of children from Nepal to India and ended up uh, meeting women in the brothels of Bombay who educated me about what they wanted. They told me that they wanted uh, a job for themselves in an office, which meant fixed hours, old age pension, no violence and dignity. But they also said they wanted to save their daughter from the same destiny as themselves. And I asked them, I said, how can we do it? And they said, basically through education. If we can put our children into schools, uh, they will have a future and they will be protected from the traffickers who come and prey upon them because they have no choices. And on the basis of that, after I won an Emmy for my documentary with these survivors of prostitution in the brothels of Bombay, I created the NGO Apne Aap. And our first thing was to hire a teacher, put a straw mat on the floor and begin to educate children of prostituted women. And over the years, fast forward, uh, we have educated more than a thousand uh, children who have finished school and college. They have jobs. Uh, one is a manager in a Domino's pizza parlor. Another went to Bard here in New York, Pars, um, another very esteemed college. Uh, some of them have become animation artists, uh, teachers, doctors, lawyers, and more are looking forward to a different future. And uh, so therefore, my advice to member states based on the experience of prevention that uh, my NGO Apne Aap has initiated with thousands of prostituted women and their children is to allocate budgets for the children of prostituted women in schools so that they can study. At the same time, what I have noticed is exactly what Kendall Alamo said, that for a survivor to restart a new life, it's very difficult if she doesn't have the tools. We provide her short-term housing, short-term childcare, legal support. But what about facing the life when she gets out of the shelter? And for that, we definitely need proper education so they can get real jobs with proper salaries or adequate salaries. And that requires uh, a seat for survivors inside colleges and universities. And again, governments can take the lead on this by talking to different universities, university associations to create scholarship funds for survivors uh, in different universities across the world because survivors cannot afford to do it themselves. They are not going to get admission. They haven't been to schools and colleges where they can write the best um, college essays or show that they have taken part in extracurricular activities. What are the extracurricular activities? Being locked up in a room and being raped repeatedly. So we really have to uh, create some sort of space for survivors to uh, which is real and practical to move forward, which is beyond sewing machines and cooking, though these are rehabilitative and they are therapeutic and they give us a process to transition into real paid jobs. And therefore, uh, my advice to all the member states who are listening in to this is that, first of all, we need money. Nothing can be done without money. And as Kendall said, we have to make sure that we don't start sidelining survivors as soon as the money comes into play. They must be, just like OSCE has shown us by example, the ODR, create survivor uh, advisory councils inside universities, because as we know, even inside universities, uh, what is happening is shocking. But to pay off for college loans, many girls are being forced to prostitute themselves and there is no one to watch out for them. So I think we will be able to create more and more space to change all this along with what is the rehabilitation of survivors and the reintegration of survivors. Um, 
so that's my second bit of advice. First is funding. Second is conversations with universities to create quotas for survivors. And the third is survivor councils inside universities, advisory councils to shape the policy. Also, I think we need to educate the university and the education system in schools and colleges, because sometimes uh, survivors can reach um, university only if they've been through schools. And many of them don't even have a chance to attend schools because the average age of a girl being trafficked is between 9 and 13 in the United States, the same as in India. And that means that if she's already trafficked, she needs catch up classes and we need to make sure that schools also are brought into this uh, initiative, uh, both for re prevention and for rehabilitation. Uh, so that's the fourth piece of advice. And the fifth is uh, for the UN's own university uh, system to uh, create research and policy backup to show that, uh, you know, this is working. Because, of course, you know, there will be people who will try to say that, uh, oh, how can a survivor attend college? How can a survivor go to school? Um, and we need to always have the data and the documentation to prove what is happening. And UN University possibly and different research bodies inside the UN can provide this backup. Uh, manuals for teachers to deal with survivors because there is PTSD and there are special needs of survivors. So uh, the survivors should not face discrimination in schools and universities, which I've noticed happens. So we need to create manuals for teachers and for university professors. Um, and so, you know, I've already given a long list of recommendations, but I would say that, uh, you know, we have enough experts on this panel. And if we do this together, we can create a world in which no girl or woman or human being is bought and sold. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very, very much, Professor. I think uh, it, it was uh, extremely important to actually highlight one some of those uh, points that, you know, uh, are definitely food for thoughts for, for government uh, moving forward. And it's it's always good that uh, we at the UN as convener to some of those uh, 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 events and, and, and policies through our um, uh, mandated uh, uh, work um, and our uh, legislative work as a custodian of the, uh, the the trafficking protocol. This is very important for us to also be able to uh, to convey this, uh, these important messages and these important bears uh, um, uh, steps and advice that you know you've been providing. So um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like now to turn to um, uh, our next speakers. So Dr. Uh, Rumi Kato Price and Ms. Uh, Tris uh, McKnight, um, because there is uh, we've been talking about education, but obviously there is a particular uh, uh, important element is the, uh, the psychological um, uh, support and and how the um, the health sector can also provide uh, some assistance to the um, uh, to survivors and and victims. So Dr. Price is a professor at the uh, Washington University School of Medicine and the founder of the Human Trafficking Collaborative Network, which is housed in the Un Institute of Public Health in Washington University. Uh, she's along, she has a, this long-standing research expertise that includes uh, methodologies for trafficking in persons and uh, trauma spectrum disorders. And she will then, as I said, mention um, uh, join in this uh, in this uh, discussion intervention by Ms. Trish uh, McKnight, who's the founder and the CEO of Butterfly Dreams Alliance, a nonprofit which uh, focuses on advocacy, technical assistance in the area of uh, family violence, sexual abuse, human trafficking, recovery, and uh, rebuilding. So um, Ms. Knight is also uh, uh, a candle on the Human Trafficking Collaborative Network that, uh, uh, that was founded by uh, Dr. Price. So we um, uh, would like to ask uh, then both uh, uh, panelists uh, first if uh, they can share with us uh, the importance of the medical profession um, uh, that is taking on, the, on a more victim-centered, trauma-informed approach when working with survivors and how uh, then maybe to Trish from the perspective of the survivor, how uh, this is very important and what kind of support they can provide uh, uh, in this area. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Good morning, distinguished guests and the colleagues. And I'd like to thank UNOC and ODC for inviting us 
to participate in this important panel. And Professor Gupta, I'm glad you went before me because you lay out the grant work of what I'd like to speak about. So regarding the questions addressed to me, yes, indeed, providing educational opportunity for survivors need to be implemented in tandem with making available appropriate medical and psychological assistance. I um, used to work with closely with the war veterans and active duty per military personnel in the United States who had suffered some form of a trauma spectrum syndrome. And when they enroll in the university courses, they often have a difficult time fitting in because of their traumatic experiences and isolation they experience on campus. So for survivors of trafficking in persons, or tip for short, the level of isolation and the psychological and the physical injury are often much worse from my experience in the data shows. So it would be ideal to create standard policies and the procedures for tip survivors to be able to receive medical and psychological counseling and the treatment coupled with tuition and other financial assistance. We are very far from having such a policy in the university, in part because TIP itself is unrecognized in most educational institutions. And further, there is no healthcare safety net for TIP survivors, unlike military service members and the veterans. The four co-founders of Human Trafficking Collective Network, or HDCN for short, came together with a mission to provide evidence-based information related to TIP research, education, and the dissemination. Our current HTCN subcommittees encompass several subspecialties in medicine, social work, survivors, um, nursing and survivors and the students, as well as community nonprofit activists. Among others, we are currently working on statistical tip definitions through a community research study in Cape Town, South Africa, locally in the St. Louis region of the state of Missouri. We are developing standardized curriculum for students in several schools. We are also working to establish small scale endowed funds to assist students and the survivors to obtain training certificate, especially on the human trafficking areas. So as for trauma informed approach, it is a core tenet in educational institutions and healthcare systems. It is actually a holistic approach when interacting with a vulnerable individual, not necessarily trafficking victims, but any vulnerable individual. Oftentimes, understanding of a childhood trauma experience, such as abuse, neglect, household dysfunctions, provide insights into pre-trafficking vulnerabilities, a standardized screening tool, such as the adverse childhood experience, or ACE for short, may be suitable in some educational settings. Typically, trauma-informed education consists of several components. For example, understanding trauma and the stress, compassion and the defendability, cultural humility, and the responsiveness, which is very important now, now that we know a, a tremendous inequality across race and the gender line. Safety and stability, that's very important for TIP survivors. Collaboration, empowerment, resilience, and recovery. Now, these principles are unfortunately still abstract. I can talk about example, but better yet, I have asked Ms. Patricia McKnight, founder and the CEO, of the Butterfly Dream Alliance the, and the author of My Justice to Join Us. She is a better person to talk about examples. So over to you, Trish. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Price, and to the organizing committee for inviting me to speak here today. Um, distinguished guests and colleagues, it is an encouraging message um, for all survivors that their lived experiences can indeed make a difference. Trauma-informed care is an absolute necessity for all professions, especially for those associating with our children. You were built for breeding was once the only perceived value I ever saw in myself. As a child, my home was not, was the most dangerous place I've ever known. And this is still an all too common reality, perfectly hidden inside our homes and families today. The years of public exploitation and home parties, witness violence, neglect of the most basic human care. It was the disregard from those around me that reinforced the belief that it didn't matter and I was not worthy. For more than 30 years, I lived trying to hide my truth and that shame trapped me. It trapped me in that dark spiral of addiction, mental illness, attempted suicides and repeated victimizations because after all, none of it mattered. In my long journey of rebuilding, years were spent connecting the dots of those painful experiences. And I've asked myself repeatedly, why didn't any of the teachers, family, friends, neighbors, random healthcare interactions, and even the police officers in our small town, why didn't someone ever ask, child, are you okay? I believe if they had known then what we know today, someone would have helped. The knowledge gained by understanding the impacts of this suffering and listening to thousands of courageous survivors who have come forward to share their stories and great work. We have learned more about human strength and resilience than we have ever known before. This knowledge helps us encourage them to live, but not just to live, to truly thrive. And by continuing to enhance those services and provide those skills, we help them create a life that is possible. And through the efforts and education about trauma and its many damaging effects, we pass forward a gift, a gift that allows us to open the door and perhaps hold their hand as they find that person inside. They can rebuild their dreams and they can create a sustainable, independent life in our most basic act of human compassion we have the ability to truly change their world. Education and care are the most basics of those. Thank you. Well, thank you um, very, very much, uh, Professor. And thank you very much, Trish, for this uh, very uh, uh, emotional uh, statement and for sharing uh, um, your experience with us today. It's I mean, we've we've been hearing through the um, the um, uh, survivor and victims um, um, representative at the at the general assembly yesterday how important it is to actually convey this type of messages more worldwide so that um, this whole work on, on human trafficking is not only focused on the um, legislative work or resolution but it actually resonates more into a. Uh, uh, what it should be all about is like centered around the victim and providing support to the victim. So thank you very much for uh, uh, for this advocacy and and I really really hope that uh, there'll be uh, other opportunities for you to um, to intervene uh, in in the event that we'll be organizing. Thank you. I'm very pleased now to introduce uh, uh, Miss uh, Ali Boak. Uh, I hope I, I, I pronounce uh, your, your name correctly. Um, a recognized international expert uh, in addressing trafficking in children and youth. Um, um, she's been working for over 25 years to develop uh, innovative um, uh, programs to empower and support uh, young people in more than 12 countries. As a, a social entrepreneur, um, she's co-founded several anti-trafficking organizations, including the International Organization for Adolescents, the Freedom Network USA, and the National Human Trafficking and Disabilities Working Group. 
She currently serves uh, the inaugural director to the Global Center on Human Trafficking at the Montclair State University, where she leads a multidisciplinary team of faculty, staff, students, uh, to mobilize uh, collective action to develop uh, some solutions to the complex problem of human trafficking. So, Ms. Boca, thank you very much to be uh, uh, with us today and uh, would be very uh, uh, um, uh, interested in, in hearing more about the center plans to, um, uh, to operate in this multidisciplinary fashion with uh, all of your colleagues with different perspective that they're bringing uh, uh, together and working hand in hand with survivors of, of trafficking. And any um, recommendation like to also maybe uh, ask the same uh, question that I asked to, um, uh, to um, uh, some of the other panelists, some of the recommendation that you could give uh, to member states to see how uh, educational institutions can effectively support survivors of trafficking persons. Thank Ali, you. you. Thank you so thank much. You. Good morning, Your Excellency, honor Honorable Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, and survivors. Thank you all so much for your insights, your experience, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this important discussion. The Global Center on Human Trafficking is, as you mentioned, a multidisciplinary university-based center at Montclair State University, which is located in Montclair, New Jersey. That's about 33 kilometers from New York City. We are a very diverse public university with over 20,000 undergraduate and graduate students. And our class of 2025 has students from 32 states and 11 countries. Our mission is to develop novel and innovative solutions to the complex problem of human trafficking. So why is this our mission so focused on novel and innovation? Because frankly, it seems that since the passage of the Palermo Protocol 21 years ago, there are still way too many victims of human trafficking, way too many traffickers, and not nearly enough support or justice for survivors of human trafficking. 21 years after the passage of the survival um, of the Palermo Protocol, survivors are still lucky to have one seat at the table. We're very focused at the Global Center on Human Trafficking of completely transforming the way we are developing responses to human trafficking by giving survivors more than just a seat at the table, but actually helping them and assisting them and supporting them be in leadership positions to form policy, research, uh, advocacy. We have six priorities for action. Survivor support and empowerment is top of the list. Education, outreach and training, collaboration and sharing, research and program evaluation, policy, advocacy and regulation, and survivor services. But our work is not carried out in silos because of our unique multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral structure um, to work locally, nationally, and internationally. Our center is based on the idea that complex problems are best solved when a group leverages diverse perspectives and expands the possible solutions through the input of multiple fields. Our center brings together distinguished faculty and staff across a wide range of discipline and fields, such as justice studies, music, visual art, public health, entrepreneurship and innovation, child advocacy, business, communications, technology, and the list goes on. A key objective of our center is to be a convener locally, nationally, and globally to bring diverse groups together to participate in reimagining the response to human trafficking hand in hand with survivors and innovators. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we operate according to a three-pronged approach. The first is the multidisciplinary aspect I just shared with you. The second is developing a model for survivor-led policy programs, research, and advocacy. We believe strongly that to move the field forward, we must engage and support survivors as leaders and partners, not just the seat at the table. We must challenge ourselves to move even further than a victim-centered approach and paradigm. And we must learn from, listen to, and build our responses based on the lived experience of survivors of all forms of human trafficking. With our partners at Corona Rising, the Global Center on Human Trafficking has launched the Global Survivor Collaborative, focused on elevating and supporting the leadership role of survivors in developing policy programs, research, and advocacy agendas. agendas. We are, our third prong of our approach is very much focused on fostering and supporting innovators to develop new um, novel approaches and solutions. This past spring, we, we launched our first social entrepreneurship program at Montclair, 
where we engage students from across a number of disciplines to come up with innovative ways to help a local service partner um, come up with ways to re better reach at risk and trafficked youth. Institutions of higher education can and should play an important role in ending human trafficking. I'll also share with you some of the recommendations since you asked for that. So one of our first recommendations is that we need to develop a global research agenda that is driven by survivors and engages survivors in all aspects of the research. Further qualitative and quantitative study by and of survivors is necessary at the macro and micro level understanding of human trafficking. We need to reduce our reliance on small unrepresentative samples and end the practice of developing interventions based on extrapolations from small convenient samples. Research must be increased in areas of the world with the highest prevalence of human trafficking. International research collaborations must be funded and supported. The only way to truly increase our knowledge on trafficking is to support and engage survivors as researchers, interviewers, data collectors, and data analysis. Secondly, we really recommend, and we are working on this, and we invite others to join in with us, um, we are developing a coordinated campus response to human trafficking. Um, not only do we need pathways to education, but we also need schools and universities and colleges to be safe places, safe spaces for people where they don't need to live in fear of being trafficked. College campuses are home to many vulnerable populations that are young people away from home for the first time, first generation students, international students, students with disabilities, LGBTQ students, students studying abroad, undocumented migrants, victims of abuse, among others. College are uniquely positioned to prevent human trafficking on, on their campuses by raising awareness and education, which is why I love the idea of the Red Chair program so much. They must also be prepared if a trafficking situation is identified on their campus or in their community. Universities must have protocols and policies in place on how to respond in a survivor-led trauma-informed way. Finally, um, universities must also offer pathways for future independence and fulfillment. As was mentioned by many of the other speakers, it's not enough for a survivor simply to have access to college. There must be scholarship programs, supportive programs in place to support them on, in all aspects, mentorship programs, um, alternative programs. Um, for many survivors, a four-year degree is just too long. Um, we have a program at Montclair for students without family support. It's called the Red Hawk F uh, Fellows Program. And this offers um, scholarship money and support for young people 18 to 24 years of age who are independent, homeless, emancipated, or aging out of the foster care. And this has been a wildly successful program and I'm working to try to expand that to have a component specifically for survivors of human trafficking. Um, we must also prepare future generations of professionals that are knowledgeable about human trafficking. It's important for universities to develop um, certificate programs, executive level research programs and courses, workshops, so that human trafficking is incorporated into all degree programs across the spectrum of the university programs. So there's many things we can do together. Um, I thank you so much for being part of this really um, important discussion today. And I look forward to collaborating with all of the universities around the world to make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, Delphine, you're muted, I think. Thank I apologize, I apologize. So sorry, Ali, just to say that, you know, thank you uh, very, very much. You've emphasized two important points, the, uh, the importance of developing some global research um, uh, for and, and by the survivors, involving the survivors, um, and also with a, a dedicated focus on areas, you know, that are particularly vulnerable to uh, human trafficking, but also um, through the educational program for mentoring and tailor-made uh, assistance throughout the entire education process, because that's what's needed, not just to help um, survivors get into some um, uh, educational program, but really to help them um, um, build the, the strengths that they, they will need to actually uh, go on and, and, and complete the, the degree. So th thank you very much for re-emphasizing those two very important points. 
Let me now uh, turn to um, uh, the co-sponsor for uh, one of the co-sponsors of, uh, of our event, um, the uh, OSCE, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, my colleague Tatiana uh, Kotyarenko, the advisor on uh, uh, anti-human trafficking at the uh, OSCE Democratic Institution and in, in Human Rights. Um, so Tatiana, she's worked uh, really hard uh, this year on the, the launch of the um, International Survivors of Trafficking uh, uh, Advisory Council that uh, Kendall uh, alluded to uh, at the beginning of this uh, of this event, and she's really prompted the uh, the inclusion of survivor voices in all aspects of the anti-trafficking work. Um, it's a very uh, important initiative, and we're very happy to have Tatiana today to uh, tell us how. A platform like like the one she's just created have uh, really helped promoting the voice of survivors and uh, including uh, accessing some educational opportunities as well as the um, uh, the psychological care and needs that survivors uh, uh, require to to help them go through this process. Tatiana, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delphine. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by recognizing and honoring every survivor leader participating in this event today and those who may not be, but whose resilience, lived experience and brilliance inspires and educates all of us on how we can do better in combating human trafficking. Trafficking in human beings persists because there's a lack of inclusion of those who were affected, the victims and survivors of trafficking, and the policies and measures to combat this crime. Individuals are trafficked for various forms of exploitation. Each of their experiences is unique, and so are their needs after they have been identified as victims or survivors. Inclusion of the experience um, and expertise of those who have, have themselves been victims and survivors of trafficking would therefore be highly beneficial for policymakers, for anti-trafficking stakeholders, and unquestionably for victims and survivors. Yet, unfortunately, these voices are rarely heard and even less consulted on anti-trafficking policies. A number of states have involved survivors in anti-trafficking policy development and work to ensure that these policies, as well as capacity building work, is informed by and reflective of the experiences and realities faced by survivors. The International Survivors Advisory Council was launched in January 2021 and we will shortly be celebrating its one year anniversary. And it is the first time that an advisory council was established by an intergovernmental organization. And in this way is an unprecedented initiative, which are, we are very proud of. There's well-established United States Advisory Council on Human Trafficking, who advise and provide recommendations to the president's interagency task force for monitoring and combating trafficking in persons. In Europe, there is a recent initiative in Albania, for example, Advisory Board for Potential and Identified Victims of Trafficking. These promising practices at the national level have inspired us at ODIR to support the survivor leader engagement at an international level. It is clear that if our work should be in fact should in fact ensure a victim and survivor centered approach, we need to involve victims and survivors of trafficking. As has been mentioned by Kendall earlier, the inaugural ESTOC consists of 21 members with due attention to diversity in terms of expertise, gender, and geographical location. Indeed, the members of this first term come from 14 countries spanning the whole of the OSCE and possess unique and versatile expertise. The purpose of ESTOC is to provide advice, guidance, and recommendations to ODIR and through ODIR to the OSCE 57 participating states on all matters pertaining to combating trafficking in human beings. In particular, the ESTOC, um, through their assistance to ODIR, would greatly benefit states in strengthening national legal policy and regulatory anti-trafficking frameworks and in promoting a stronger victim and survivor-centered approach to combating human trafficking. Moreover, ESTOC is playing a crucial role by providing guidance to survivors of trafficking in around the globe on tools necessary to foster survivor leadership, as well as the growth of national and international survivor networks, which to date are still an underdeveloped potential. Strengthened leadership of survivors will provide states with a valuable resource to draw on when supporting national anti-trafficking efforts. With ESTAC and other survivor participation, we can revolutionize our approaches across, across the world to combating trafficking. 
and break the cycles of impunity and finally be steps ahead and not behind in understanding this evolving crime, prevention strategies, and the needs of victims and survivors. Ordeer looks forward to launching next year an online educational platform to foster survivor leadership, which will be available to all of you. I would like to highlight that ODIR and the International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council stand ready to assist states. As you have seen during the last two days, a number of ESTAC members have done just that, from Malaiko Ringo at the opening ceremony together with Kendall to Chandra Vovaruntu, as well as the rest of ESTAC members virtually. They're taking the world by storm and are showing all of us how we can strengthen and improve our responses to be truly victim and survivor centered. I'm most stop at identification, rescue, and provision of services. Kendall's focus is on ensuring social inclusion and providing survivors of trafficking with an opportunity to move from a state of just survival to a future with possibilities of health, financial stability, and professional success. Without tailored healthcare and educational opportunities, many survivors, as we have heard from every speaker today, remain in cycles of vulnerability to further abuse and exploitation. Without education, their dreams of personal development and a career remain unfulfilled. Many can't access financial aid or loans for education due to, to their history of trafficking, which resulted in debt, including medical debt or criminal records. This is why I would like to encourage all of you to support Kendall's Red Chair campaign and advocate for universities around the world to create red chairs and ensure that victims and survivors across the world know that we are working not just to assist them from situations of trafficking, but also in ensuring that the sky is the limit for them. I also ask you to give one such share to Kendall herself. I would like to close by thanking the co-organizers, especially UNODC and ICAT for prioritizing inclusion of survivors' voices in all anti-trafficking initiatives. Thank you for your attention. Sorry very much, uh, uh, Tatiana, um, and thank you very much for also being a, a, such a, a strong partner of uh, uh, of the uh, the ICAT initiative and 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 for giving giving some 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 to shed some lights on on this uh, this wonderful uh, uh, initiative of yours. And um, it's also important to um, to praise the work of uh, international and regional organizations in um, in the fight against uh, um, uh, trafficking in persons. It's not only uh, at the UN, but um, the the, the work and initiative that um, OSCE and, and, and other regional organizations have launched throughout the world um, should also be uh, uh, commended for uh, being part of the uh, the overall work which is being assessed and uh, and that led really to this uh, new political declaration that uh, that we have now and that uh, uh, all of us uh, being international organization as well as member states will have um, uh, the um, the requirement to uh, to uh, implement to as effectively as possible. So th thank you very much for um, uh, for sharing this um, this thoughts with us today. It is now my my pleasure to turn to uh, our final speaker uh, and Miss uh, Mira Sorvino, uh, who's uh, UNODC Goodwill Ambassador for the fight against uh, human trafficking and who's been intervening recurrently in in most of our uh, human trafficking events. And we thought, you know, having Mira with us at this at this stage uh, was a, a great way of of bringing uh, all that uh, the, the the wonderful, very inspiring uh, thoughts and recommendations that have been shared with us in all the various um, 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 different um, topics that that we've covered, from a psychological support to a, 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 a educational uh, advocacy um, um, training. Uh, that you know she. Maybe uh, is the best way of of um, of bringing like a, a, an overall uh, uh, umbrella and, and commonality through uh, some concluding uh, uh, remarks for this event. Mira, thank you very much for being with us today. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Delphine. Uh, can can you hear me all right? Is my sound all right, or do I should I put on? Yes, the perfect. It's okay. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> uh, good morning, Excellencies. Uh, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, thank you so much, all of you survivor leaders, for your incredible work that you're doing, the innovation you're bringing to this field, um, the possible steps towards finally gaining some inroads against this hideous situation that you, better than anyone else, understand firsthand the damage. 
Um, this is kind of an exciting time because uh, we are seeing as it should be, really the baton is being passed to survivor leaders finally, as it should be. Um, I, I'm honored to be here, but only as a reflection of all of your words and all the work that you're doing. Um, I started working with UNODC in 2009 as their Goodwill Ambassador in the Global Fight Against Human Trafficking. Um, I was instantly galvanized by the testimonies of survivors that I interviewed, and many of them at that time could not actually attend events such as this, um, were not even perhaps psychologically supported enough to be public with their journeys, um, with their thoughts. but everything they told me informed every inch of any advocacy that I tried to create on my own. I always wanted to bring their voices to the front. And now seeing you, the experts really take over, this is the best thing that could be possibly happening to this um, movement, to this surge worldwide to fight this crime. Um, I was part of the drafting sessions of the Global Plan of Action initially, and I was part of the decision-making, uh, maybe only a tiny part, but I was urging very strongly for it for the creation of the, uh, the fund, the trust fund for victims of trafficking in persons. And um, this is exciting to see that we are now talking about the integration of the structures that have been created and the possible solutions out there that the fund can support. And it can only support these innovations as in as much as it has support. So if all of you member states who are listening to this um, believe in the results that you're hearing from our incredible speakers about the growth that is possible for exiting trafficking and then growing into one's full potential through education, through a trauma-informed support, um, then I urge you to give more as your your country's gift to the the global plan I, I encourage the private sector to listen today and if you have a little bit of extra in your pocketbook this coming holiday season to consider giving it to the fund um <clears throat> now let's let's talk about let's highlight a little bit what each of our wonderful speakers have brought to the table um wow kendall alimo it just I'm really moved by by your initiative with the red chairs I think it's such a tangible and visual um, concept that that share is holding space for all of those who have yet to achieve their dreams of being in higher education as, as you wish to be, as, as we, you wish to serve in the medical community in a gap you saw that would then serve the population of people who were vulnerable to trafficking. Um, and I, I would like to, I don't know if my alma mater is represented, but I'll find out afterwards. And if not, I'll, I'll send a chair to them. Um, but uh, that's Harvard, by the way. So Harvard, if you're listening and you don't have a red chair, you need a red chair and you need a survivor-centric approach to human trafficking, education, and policy ideation. Um, and I think that the idea that you introduced about uh, first of all, the risks of re-exploitation, even while in a higher education set setting, are very important. Um, the primacy of a home over a house, um, the idea of not just having sort of uh, assets on paper, such as, well, I'm going to classes, but actually really being supported into growing into the person that you see yourself as being on the inside. Um, that. I think I think that really, you know, I think everyone in their own way echoed that importance. Um, but uh, it, it brings to mind one of the first survivors that I and, and by the way, even when I use the word survivor, I, I get nervous. I, I don't like the word victim. I don't love the word survivor. I've heard various other terms being used by friends of mine who have exited multiple forms of trafficking. Um, one of them used the word overcomers as the preferred term. One of them used the word uh, thriver. One of them used the term warrior. And so I want to honor that journey and that that identity and allow it to be self-created, not just sort of imposed as though as though surviving this crime, this this abuse, this this you know uh, flagrant um, violation of your human rights is what defines you. I would like you to define yourselves. Um, but I know that these are the terms that we currently work with. So we'll use survivor as the, the common parlance. 
Um, but one of one of those people who I interviewed on my first UNODC trip to Mexico City, and her words have haunted me ever since. Um, and I used them in one of my very first speeches for the United Nations. Uh, but she was a young woman who had been sex trafficked, and she uh, said, you know, people would use her her body, um, they would exploit her, and say they would laugh at her. And she said, police chiefs and lawyers and doctors would laugh at her and say, you're nothing, you're lower than a cockroach. And she said that they thought we were born for this, but we were born for so much more than this. And I think that education is the sort of alpha and omega of this whole situation. It is the lack of access to stability, safe housing, um, racial and gender-based equality and education that creates the vulnerability to being trafficked in the first place, as well as interpersonal issues such as family of origin and what happens in the home. Um, but this same young woman was getting her law degree to become prosecutor to fight the crime of human trafficking. And she was one of the first people I met and I saw in her, wow, there is a chance in a lifetime to turn her own devastation into her own empowerment and she's self-led and she's she's doing what she wants to do and becoming what she was born to be, even if what she was born to be was shaped by her trauma. Um, let's talk about Rachel Lloyd's educational initiative, um, you know, to register, just to register. I think that's really powerful, just, just supporting that first step that might be almost inconceivable for people who don't come from a background where people got higher educations or in, even finished high school, um, who don't think it's in their ken, that it's in their, on their horizon to be able to access something like that for themselves because of the exigencies of their need for survival, for the money, as she said, to feed themselves and their children. Um, you know, I love the, the encouragement and normalization of the concept of college higher education instead of that one-way subsistence level employment. And, you know, acknowledging that it's a struggle to stay in college for survivors. Um, and this college prep concept that you've created, the, the 12 weeks gems you, uh, the safe environment to learn about financial aid, writing essays, having safe housing, trying to bridge that gap for those without traditional educational pathways, and also recognizing the impact of educational inequity on girls and young women of color, you know, making sure that all policies are intersectional in, you know, in regards to class, race, gender. Um, I, I just think that focusing on those small things such as metro cards and normalizing achievements make all the difference to perhaps keep a person, an individual on her path or on their path to realizing that dream, becoming who they want to be, and then breaking that cycle of being re-exploited and falling back into that vulnerability area. Um, I also wanted, I, I forgot to mention also to celebrate um, uh, Kendall's uh, creation of the, the, the concept of, of funding education for survivors through university endowments. Uh, I think that's really novel and important because just finding that money and not having to cobble it together to create that pathway to education is super crucial. So I, I thought that was really brilliant. Um, and Ruchira, who I'm, I'm so in awe of Ruchira Gupta always, um, but you know her concept that the education system itself needs to be educated was important that that you know human trafficking survivor led advisory boards should be established within universities uh because i don't think that most universities or high schools are trauma informed at all and and very little on this topic especially because how many students have they knowingly had that are survivors of this atrocity very very few so they ha have to open up and have that humility that they don't know what they don't know and therefore need to be led to have a survivor trauma-informed wraparound program to deal with the special needs of people coming out of this situation. And I think, you know, for her emphasizing that the average age for initiation to sex trafficking is between nine and 13, many have not even been in school. You know, so we're talking about, you know, primary or secondary school, not just um, college. Um, and it, it brings to mind, you know, some of the work that I've uh, 
partnered with uh, Agape International Missions AIM in Cambodia, where they saw the need in the community that if in order, if they were going to reverse a system where it was kind of endemic um, for children to be trafficked even by their own families so that they could pay off debts, they had to educate the entire community. So they created a really giant school um, that goes from preschool to master's degree and it has the capacity for thousands of students and then has social workers who do home visits. So even the siblings of those who may not go to the school are checked upon and parents are, are, are sort of brought along in this community wide chance to bring people to their feet and create alternative pathways towards not only subsistence level living, but thriving and growth and changing the culture thinking there is another way besides doing the unthinkable, um, our children can support us by becoming doctors and lawyers and teachers and whatever they want to be rather than whatever they need to be because we're so desperate. Um, so uh, that's just one example of, you know, an innovative approach to, to creating education that was specifically for starting with children, but going all the way up through a graduate program for people who had been trafficked or people who were vulnerable to being trafficked um, and then creating wraparound support for the economics of the families, uh, giving micro loans, helping giving them uh, job opportunities so the children could stay in school. Um, I think Dr. Price, uh, I loved your intervention about the, the need for medical and psychological assistance. Um, that has to be combined with that support to educate because the isolation and the complex trauma is very deep. It's, it's, and yet, if you compare it to the resources available for war veterans, for soldiers, it's just, it's just not there yet. We don't have that, even though I would argue that um, human trafficking survivors have been through some of the worst trauma that, that you know, humanity has to offer. Um, and that needs to be remedied and that needs to be sort of front and center of any of any policy to create educational pathways. There also has to be that wraparound support on the psychological and the medical side. Um, uh, Patricia McKnight, uh, the lived experience of survivors makes a huge difference. The trauma informed approach is crucial. Um, I, I thought it was particularly poignant uh, what she talked about, the experience of not mattering, her suffering not mattering. No one intervening, no experts, no no elders in the community who should have known better, who should have been trained to look for the warning signs of what was going on with her. No one even asking about her, her welfare, no one helped. Um, but now she believes, and I think that's hopeful and, and optimistic, but hopefully eventually it will become a certainty that people in civil society will be trained well enough to see those warning signs. So that education goes both ways. It has to go towards the survivor, but it also has to go towards the community around them so that they can help be on the team of finding vulnerable individuals and pulling them out of their situations. I, I have another friend who uh, was trafficked in the United States um, from the time she was very, very young and it fell into that window. And it was interesting that the concept that the average age for entrance into sex trafficking for girls is between nine and 13, no matter where you are from, from um, Ruchira Gupta. Uh, she was 11 when she started being sold outside of her home, but before that she had been um, terribly abused from the time she was six. And she said, she showed all the signs of this abuse all throughout high school. She had bouts with depression. She was a very good student, but um, would be covered with bruise. Her jaw was broken several times and the emergency room saw her several times and saw the, saw the x-rays for fractures that couldn't have been self-created, couldn't have been created from a fall. They were from repeated abuse. And yet no one really stepped in and said, what is going on with you? Who is hurting you? And at that point they could have seven years in broken into her abuse, which instead lasted again until she was 29. Um, this same person right now with an intensive healing um, opportunity is now all of a sudden I'm hearing her talk about her future horizons really changing because she is considering these educational pathways where she can be of service um, 
in a much broader way than I ever heard her talk before, before she had smaller jobs, part-time jobs, and was just kind of thinking of surviving. And now she's thinking, how can I, how can I get involved? How can I be the person that I want to be the rest of my life? And uh, I'm so proud of her and it's so exciting to hear, but without that incredible psychological support and, and healing opportunities, intensive healing, you know, opportunities provided to her, these dreams of her education and career paths would not be possible. So, you know, all of them have to come together holistically as we've heard by everyone. And that, you know, as Ms. McKnight said, through our compassion education chair, we do have the opportunity to change the world and the trajectories of people who've been traumatized by this experience. Um, from Ali Boak, uh, the Global Center on Human Trafficking at Montclair University sounds fascinating. Um, you know, focusing on transforming the modalities in which ideation occurs for solutions to human trafficking that puts survivors in leadership positions uh, with a multidisciplinary approach and encouraging innovation combining with local community service groups. So ultimately, these, you know, uh, center, centers of learning, these sort of bastions of intellectual achievement um, really serve best if their ideas don't stay in their ivory towers, but instead radiate out to the community. So the idea of partnership, which is always one of the four Ps that we at UNODC promote, um, it's so essential because otherwise you just have these silos of people doing good things or having good ideas. But if you don't put them into action on the ground in your actual community and you're mixing the community with the university and the learning and the leadership, then how are you going to really spread that change on the ground? So I, I think that this is, it sounds like a wonderful program and I'd, I'd love to learn more about it. Um, and, you know, she recommended the need for global research agenda. So, so we're not working from small non-representative groups of survivors. And, and that is absolutely key because if, if we only have a very small amount of data, how can we really understand the flows and trends of what is happening and how to best address it? Um, so, and I also thought it was interesting when she talked about support needed to wrap around each student because, you know, they've created programs around those who may not have housing, who have other forms of instability that would challenge any student and certainly would be issues for trafficking survivors. And then lastly, um, uh, Tatiana Kokyarenko talking about the International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council for uh, OSCE. That's really a step forward to, to put survivors front and center on uh, a council that really could have real teeth in, in, in actually transforming policy from a, you know, survivor led trauma informed, um, you know, culturally gender and race sensitive um, place. I, I, I think that this is where, you know, the pedal hits the metal, you know, or the I'm not using that expression correctly, but this is this is where we actually see the fruition of all the lived experience of all these incredibly strong, brave, intelligent leaders, wise leaders start to shape the policy that will affect the population that they have come out of and that they represent. Um, so I am so excited about that. And uh, you know, I, I look forward to supporting and having, you know, continuing with UNODC to support um, the recommendations that come out of this group and, and of all of you uh, esteemed experts who are here today. Uh, it's an honor to hear and learn from you. And um, I just am pledging to continue to support all of your recommendations. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Mira, for so eloquently um, um, summarizing uh, this uh, important uh, elements that you know have been discussed uh, during this uh, very, very rich and, and condensed events. I'm very, very sorry we went over time, and I'm conscious that you know it's already uh, the the second day of the um, the high level meeting has already started for half an hour. So I'm no doubt we, you will be able to now switch to the um, UN Web TV for those of you who are not uh, uh, located in New York uh, to listen to some of the member state statements. But thank you very, very much to all the speakers um, for um, sharing 
um, their experience, their lessons learned, as well as their um, recommendations for member states uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, we would like um, very hope that it is just not like a, a one uh, time event, but that is really kind of a, uh, lead the way to some more regular uh, discussions and giving the voice to survivors, because if the political declaration uh, has done is really to uh, uh, make sure that the, the 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 perspective of the victims and survivors is really at the center, or should be, and the center should be more at the center of uh, of any anti-trafficking uh, policies to be developed by member states, uh, according to um, uh, the obligation that they've all uh, signed uh, uh, and they've all uh, ratified in becoming parties to the um, uh, dedicated protocol on human trafficking, and this is really uh, at the center of it. So thank you very much much for sharing all those uh, very uh, uh, important experience on the, uh, the educational uh, opportunities. Uh, we are, of course, available to provide more uh, information on the University Alliance on Human Trafficking that uh, that Kendall uh, uh, launched, uh, also on the International Survival of Trafficking Advisory Council, and any other initiative that you know have been discussed during this, uh, this event. Uh, uh, we uh, remain uh, available to put you in contact with uh, all the speakers and uh, we very much hope, uh, as I said, that uh, this discussion will will continue. So thank you very much for your your time, uh, for your uh, inspiration, and um, leaving a lot of hope, as Mira mentioned, that uh, there is a change. There is a change in the mindset, and that uh, in with all this initiative, um, there is certainly a, a way for victims of survivors to. Um, be able to see their future in a much brighter way. So um, a big thank you. I think we have nothing else to say from our side. And also would like to a personal thank to uh, all the uh, uh, my my team, um, uh, Hannah, uh, Deborah, Natalia, and Nina for putting together this wonderful event and for the support um, uh, in reaching out to you and making sure that you know we had this wonderful perspective and diverse perspective uh, during this uh, this important side event of the high level. Uh, a meeting on the appraisal of the global plan of action. So thank you very much. Wishing you all the best and uh, a good um, um, continuation if you are following the high level event. Thank you very much. Goodbye.